Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Vance. By, may I begin by saying what a great joy it was to have that Native American welcome. It's hit the right note uh, for this Congress. There's a very busy week ahead and there's some wonderful presentations to be heard and seen. So I'm very conscious of time. So let me begin by thanking everybody who's put this Congress together, and in particular Vance Martin, and I'd like you to give him a big hand. gave him wonderful support and I know that he will be acknowledging them. But today I also wish to pay special tribute to Michael Thorison of the Thorison Foundation who made the original substantial donation of $200,000 which really got this Congress going. recently out in South Africa and went out into the wilderness with the Wilderness Leadership School and the Zulu people being what they are, they looked at him and watched him with great interest and they give you a name and it's always pertinent. Michael arises very early in the morning and it's the time when the fish eagle falls. He's also tall and got these piercing eyes so his Zulu name is Nkwazi which means the fish eagle. <laughs> I'm very pleased that we have such good representation from the different foundations, the Wilderness Foundation in the United Kingdom, the Wilderness Foundation in South Africa, the Wilderness Foundation in Germany, and of course, Wild in the United States. Now, as I flew from my country on our way here, and by the way, it's a long flight. <laughs> You know, I look down from 30,000 feet or whatever it is, and one looks on some pretty devastated country. And a man named Richard Melson once said that the abandonment of ethically and spiritually based relationship with nature by our Western ancestors was one of the greatest and perilous transformations of the Western mind. And today, Nearly all modern man's ills spring from this abandonment. And this is why wilderness has become so important. Because it reconnects us to that ancient world which we once knew so intimately. And we South Africans can be very proud, and there are many in the audience today, we can be very proud that it was South Africa who was the first to proclaim a game reserve in Africa and the very first to proclaim the wilderness area. And Umpholozi Game Reserve in KwaZulu Natal has that double distinction. The World Wilderness Congress has come a long way on a tortuous path and has had to overcome what at times seem to be almost insuperable odds. But it has now become critically important as a forum which provides a platform for divergent views. And we are very proud, as Vance will tell you, of our achievements. Not the least being the publishing of our proceedings, which Lawrence, Sir Colonel Sir Lawrence van der Post urged right in the very beginning. And we have to thank Bob Barron of Fulcrum for ensuring that those proceedings continue. This is likely to be my last Congress. And I think it's important that we should look at the history of it for a moment. It has become the longest running public international environmental forum. And the Congress was born in South Africa in 1976 in the small wilderness area in Omphalozi Game Reserve. And it was it's a just suggestion of my great friend McCorbin Dombella, who with me had led many treks into the wilderness. But the time had come, he said, 
to have a great endowment, a gathering, to bring everybody who'd been out in the wilderness, to bring them all together, so that they could share their experiences. He was a man who could neither read nor write, but he was the wisest, the most gracious, and the bravest man that I've ever known. And the African people have a word for it, Ubuntu. Well, I said to him, that's great, Makuba, but who's going to put this thing together? He said, when? You. You can read and write, you can do it. And it's fitting, too, that the first Congress began in Africa. Because it is the cradle of mankind. All of us here have our origin in that mighty continent. C.T. Jung, the great deaf psychologist, once said, we do not come into the world tabula rasa. We do not come in with a clean slate. We've got three million years of Africa imprinted on our psyche. And I and other guides know this from taking many people out into the wilderness as a place like Mpulosi, Kruger National Park and others. And to see how they are gripped by the spirit of Africa. And particularly at night as they sleep on that red earth, that very ancient earth, and they dream their dreams. There is a connection that is evoked from the depths of the collective unconscious that joins us all together. And also when they hear the leopard at night, that rasping call it. It sparks something inside. That very ancient leopard, Dina Felis, that used to pray on the early hominids. And then there's the howl of the hyena, which we heard in the scream of the elephant. And it's an experience that has awakened thousands of people to the value of African wilderness and the understanding that this was once their home. And it inspires them to protect it because it is the landscape of the human soul. In 1977, South Africa was the pariah of the world. And organizing that first World Wilderness Congress, of which there are a few people who were there, Bill Bainbridge, Ian Douglas Hamilton, Michael Sweetman, and a few others, was a great nightmare. But the Congress was an undeniable success, even in those terrible times of 1977. Because it was the first time in the history of South Africa that a black man, a field ranger, and a bushman of the sand people were on the same platform as leading politicians, writers, poets, and artists. They stood there on their own. And the Congress, without doubt, established the beginning of a lot of breaking down of racial barriers in South Africa. And the wilderness trails that we've been doing since 1957 was a great contributor to that as well. I'm a fool who used to take these trails with me when we were sitting around the fire at night with a group of black people and Indian people and colored people, he always used to say, you see, if a lion comes down and grabs one of us or a black rhino charges and we get horned, the blood that flows will be the same color. The first Congress was so successful that the Australians who were there asked to establish the next one in Australia. But again, there were political problems. The political problem this time was because of me. I was a South African. <laughs> but I'll always be very grateful to those international conservationists, and the Americans in particular, who stood by us to ensure that the Congresses became the forum that they have become. And Vance Martin knows this because he was at the coal face from 1993. Today, Thanks to Nelson Mandela, 
and the peaceful elections of 1994, the miraculous peaceful elections. South Africa is the brightest light on the continent of Africa. And it stands poised to be a wilderness and conservation example for all of emerging Africa. But we in the World Wilderness Movement are under no illusions about the difficulties that lie ahead. The struggle for political freedom is over in South Africa, but not in all African states. And the new struggle right down at the bottom is an environmental one, so that all people can make use, wise use of the natural resources. In 2001, Congress came back to South Africa. What a wonderful time it was. It was a transformed country. And thanks to Andrew Muir and Adrian Gardner and the Eastern Cape government, it was a phenomenal success. And it proved what South Africa could do. I do not want to enlarge on the litany of woes facing the rest of Africa, but let me tell you that there are some places where the game scouts do not even have boots. And in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there are now probably between 10 and 15 of the Northern White Rhino surviving. When in 1960, when I went there, there were well over a thousand. And at the recent G8 summit in Britain, there was focus on Africa. And one can only hope that those politicians will give proper attention to the environment because previous aid to South Africa, to Africa, did not materialize as it should have done. Now, whereas it is true that the birth of the World Wilderness Congress was in South Africa, the honor for the establishment of national parks and wilderness areas belongs to the United States. It was the Americans who articulated the wilderness concept. And set aside wilderness areas against what at times seemed to be overwhelming odds. But the spirit of one of the greatest presidents of the United States of all time, in my opinion, was always there with them, Teddy Roosevelt. And you have to remember too that Teddy Roosevelt was a great hunter in Uganda who went out with the black Ugandans and also with Frederick Courtney Salu, that great hunter. And they became very firm friends. So Africa was always in Teddy Roosevelt's mind. In that wonderful book that he wrote, African Game Trails, you can see it. And in my library, there is a book with the prosaic title of S1176, Hearings Before the Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs of the United States Senate. The pages are worn thin and underlined everywhere. The cover is tattered from constant use and it has been in my possession since 1958, sent to me by a very great American, Howard Zarnasar who was then Secretary of the Wilderness Society. And in it I have written, this has been the Bible of the wilderness movement in South Africa. The Americans showed us the way. And these proceedings are a phenomenal story of the past, the present, and the future. One of the witnesses was Sigurd Olsen, and just listen to what he said. In days to come, the wilderness concept must be clear and shining enough to capture imaginations. It must take its place as a cultural force with all expressions of man's deepest yearnings and his noblest achievements in the realm of the mind. And he goes on to say, it must be powerful enough to withstand everywhere in the world the coming of enormous pressures of industry and population. 
Talk about intimations of the future. That was it. S1176 is the gripping story of the blood and guts fight for the conservation soul in the United States. You realize too when you read this and listening today to the Native Americans that in it, it is expressing the depth of the impact that the Native Americans made on the psyche of the Anglo-Americans. Constantly as you read it, you can hear the echoes and one senses their spirit in the extraordinary eloquent pleas from some of the most eminent Americans of the day. I first came to America in 1964 and through Ira Gabrielson I met Stuart Udall, then Secretary of the Interior. A man immensely proud of his Native American blood. And he became one of the first speakers at the First World Wilderness Congress in 1977. Fifteen minutes in his company gave me a deep and emotionally moving insight into the soul of American conservation. But he reiterated again and again that America had to lead the world. And in order to do so, they had to do what was right. And so the men and women who testified in S1176 were heroic people. Many times going against the grain and knowing that they were up against it. They warned against roads, lodges, hotels, restaurants in the national parks. They knew that what they were talking about and what they wanted was setting an example. And they were unafraid to talk about spirit. And it was so great to hear Governor Heckle mention it today. And it was that that inspired me to create the Wilderness Leadership School. And to unashamedly say that we were taking people on a spiritual journey. You know, another one of the witnesses was a man called Edwin Teal. And he said that wilderness areas are storehouses of wildness. And wildness will become ever increasing as a spiritual need in a crowded tomorrow. Well, not here, but in the rest of America, we are already in the crowded tomorrow. <laughs> Try a Los Angeles freeway on what they call a quiet day. <laughs> <laughs> the wilderness work that America articulated and the rest of the world has followed is practical, it's political, it's philosophical, it's psychological, and it's scientific. But at the deepest level, and I had the great pleasure of talking to a seminar yesterday of forest and national parks people, at the deepest level, there are still too few people who understand that it is the work of the soul. And the lines of the psalm say it best, be still and know that I am God. And it's in the wilderness that the stillness can be found. And we have to face the fact that rampant materialism is creating havoc in our world. And wildernesses, as Willem von Richt of South Africa was telling me at breakfast today, are under threat everywhere. And Bill Bainbridge, who conducted an excellent seminar at the Ramadi Inn over the last week on management of wilderness also knows. They are under threat everywhere. And it has not been helped in many instances by Judeo-Christianity. Edward Whitmont put it most succinctly. He said for several centuries, centuries traditional theology has tended to create an absolute gulf between man and nature. And in my own church I have to fight when I see this dominion, this word dominion. Not we are stewards. And yet the world seems to continue in some places if there's no tomorrow. We have forgotten those wonderful images 
that we read in the Bible like John the Baptist coming out clothed with camel hair and the leather belt around his waist and eating locusts and honey the epitome of spiritual and simplicity and for too long too there's been this cataclysmic clash between Western and indigenous cultures and other wild country in Britain. There is now the terrible potential of the destruction, potential destruction to birds, landscapes, and most importantly, silence with the proposed wind farms. And I'm glad to say the Wilderness Foundation UK is in the forefront of bringing that to the attention of the people of the United Kingdom. Marie Louise von Franz, who was a great ally of Jung, once said, Western civilization is in danger of building a wall of rationality in its society, which feeling cannot penetrate. Everything has to be rational, and emotion is frowned upon. And those of like me brought up in my generation, you are not allowed to be emotional. And this is why the poets are critically important and why we have them at the World Wilderness Congresses. They are critically important to our cause. Wilfred Owen and I choke when I think of it, a First World War poet A nice ghastly war of all wars. He said, all that a poet can do is to warn. And this is why true poets must be truthful. Poets warn us and they inspire us. And just think of these words for a moment from a poet, and I think it was W.H. Auden, of Ecological Doomsday. The stars are not wanted now. Put out everyone. Back up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the oceans and sweep up the wood for nothing now can come to any good well might we gasp at the horror of that and yet the converse the inspiration comes from a man like Herman Hesse he says sometimes when a bird cries out or the wind swoops through a tree or a dog howls in a far off place I hold still and listen a long time. My soul turns and goes back to the place where a thousand forgotten years ago the bird and the blowing wind were like me and were my brothers. One of my greatest friends was John Aspinall, the biggest gambler in the United Kingdom, an incredible man, eccentric as all get out. Famous. And he became a conservationist and he poured millions into the savings of the gorilla and other conservation causes, including our own. And he eventually got cancer of the jaw and he suffered the most ghastly pain. But he continued to come and to talk whenever he was asked to, wrapped in bandages. And at his place down at Howlett's, he would get in and he would play with these huge gorillas. And he said, and I'm nearly finished now, I believe that wilderness, this is a gambler, this, I believe that wilderness is the earth's greatest treasure. 
Wilderness is the bank on which all checks are drawn. I believe our debt to nature is total. I believe that unless we recognize this debt and renegotiate it, we will write our own epitaph. I believe that there's an outside chance to save the earth and most of its tenants. That outside chance must be grasped with gambler's hands. I believe that terrible risks must be taken and terrible passions roused before these ends can be accomplished. And all of us here are engaged in this momentous struggle. And we owe it to the early pioneers, to the Roosevelt's, the John Muir's, the Howard Zarnas's, the Ira Gableton's, and others. So this now is our task in the 20th century, 21st century. We need something that will stir our psychic depths and touch the images of the soul. And it has to surpass creeds and instantly be recognized by everyone. We must learn a new language to convey the feelings of beauty, hope, inspiration, and sacredness for humanity and all other life. We need to remember that the first principle of ecology is that everything is connected to everything else. And this is why the wilderness experience is a spiritual spark that ignites that understanding. I thank you very much for your patience.